Hello, my name is Janice B. Gordon. This is Scale Your Sales Podcast. Welcome to the Scale Your Sales Podcast, listed number nine of 42 best podcasts for every sales professional in 2021. I am Janice B. Gordon, the customer growth expert, recommended by LinkedIn as one of 15 innovative sales influencers to follow in 2021. In today's episode, my guest talks about her newly released book, Nine Ways to Develop Highly Effective Salespeople. Now, this is based on research she did for her PhD that uncovered that most successful salespeople are self-directed learners. No matter how big or small your personal desires may be, my next guest's sales process will teach you how to position yourself as the solution for others so you can get what you want. She is a sales and marketing professor at Bryant University and co-founder of MNMKRS. She loves to help people to grow and see their potential. Hello and welcome to Scale Your Sales podcast, Stephanie. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation, Janice. Well, I'll tell the audience, I have been following Stephanie Boyer, PhD, for a long, long time. And I've been fighting to get her on here. And she, she's got so much gr- great insight and knowledge to share with us. And it's uh, just a shame we've only got 20 minutes to do it in. So I'm going to dive right in there because I know you're a busy lady and there's so many things that you're you're involved in to do with sales. But the first thing I wanted to ask you was about rnmkrs.org and the bias-free feedback. So tell me more about that because I think this is quite a new adventure for you. It is. It is a new adventure. And really with that, I run the sales program at Bryant University and I teach the students how to sell. And the best way to teach someone how to sell is to get them to practice having a sales conversation. But they can't have a sales conversation with me all the time. Uh, I'm only one person and I can't give them feedback on the conversations that they have with each other uh, at scale. And so Rainmakers, R-N-M-K-R-S, it's Rainmakers without any of the vowels, it gives the students an opportunity to have lots of practice having sales conversations with an animated customer bot. So you have a buyer that's in the conversation, the students read a case and they understand I'm selling uh, Dell computers to this fire station is what what the competition is this semester. The students go in and they practice as much as they can having the conversations. They get immediate feedback on what they need to do to improve. And then um, at the end of the semester, we do a competition. So the students can all see who really is doing it best. Interesting. So was this developed, it was de- came out of your, your work in um, the, the school and training people um, how to sell, but where do you see it going? Well, you know, we're hoping that we can just have the biggest impact that we can have with this. Um, I'm very passionate about helping people learn how to sell more effectively, uh, doing it the right way. Sales is all about helping people. It's not about taking advantage and trying to get your way. It's about making an impact, helping someone's life to be a little bit better, helping someone advocate for themselves. And so we're hoping that we can continue doing this on a bigger scale. We have a huge part of the college sales training market. Market, and um, companies have started asking us to create these programs so that they can get their own sales teams to also sell, sell more effectively. So tell me more about the bias-free feedback. Sure, sure. So typically, if you have a sales conversation um, and you have someone that's a judge doing the scoring, they're going to probably get distracted. Maybe they got an email or a text or something that they need to attend to. So there's going to be some variety there. But also, we are humans and we all have bias, whether we know about it or even if it's unconscious. And so with the bot, it really doesn't care 
what is the name of the student? What's the color of their skin? What's their political? Like, it doesn't have any kind of affiliation with that. It's just how well they can sell, sell and focusing on that sales process itself. So that's what it's scoring on. And typically what we see sometimes in sales competitions is the more you look like the person that is judging you, the better you do. And we really wanted to get away from that. And so this is just focusing on that element of it. Okay. I love that. I love that. However, we are in the real world, aren't we? And yeah. people do have biases. So your your buyers, your customers, even the sales leader that you may be pitching to for, for a job. So how can you, if the this was going to roll out into organizations to help salespeople to improve, they may improve, but when they get in front of the real person, they still have that, that bias. So how do you reconcile those two things? Oh, so how do you handle the fact that someone does have a bias in there? That's well, you've been we... trained on, on, uh, in an environment that eliminates the bias, but when you go out into the world, the bias is still there. So how do you reconcile the two things? That's a, that's a really big question. And I think that's something that a lot of organizations are trying to figure out and, you know, how do we train and how do we train on things like unconscious bias? Now, what we're trying to do with Rainmakers is to help people to become more confident and know that they have a shot at winning the competition, um, that they can improve their skills and they have the confidence. Because what's happening now is some of the students are just so discouraged to even participate um, that they may not even go after the training that they can they can get. So we're not really approaching that challenge uh, in the training itself, but that is something that that is really important. And I think you know having a good management team that is going to focus on supporting their salespeople is is extremely important. But I think understanding that there are biases out there, and if you can focus on helping the customer and having those really great conversations perhaps the customer can see past some of that bias, perhaps trying to go in in the beginning of the conversation and be vulnerable and create trust and create interest in order to kind of move away from some of that bias. Excellent, excellent. So talking about the customer and the experience, um, what's your view on to the extent that customer experience, buyer experience impacts the sales outcome? Oh, it absolutely does. Um, gosh, you know, I forget the the, uh, the author of the study, um, but we we saw a study where they were looking at, you know, what is it that creates customer loyalty? Uh, is it the product itself? Is it the brand? Is it the company? Is it the service? What is it? And what we actually saw was that seventy percent of the background or reason to have this uh, repeat or loyal customer is really all based on that customer experience. And that's the role of the salesperson to provide the customer experience to coordinate um, the entire logistics of, you know, talking to the customer all the way to get the product or service into the customer's business, uh, and then going from there to help them use it more effectively, making sure that things show up on time, that they're, they're feeling very confident uh, making that actual purchase. So that customer experience is the most important thing that you can provide as a salesperson. And that, do you think that's changed enormously? It's always been the case, but we've, we've only just become aware of it. I think that the salesperson that has been successful in the past has always executed that well. Um, and now after what we've kind of been through over the last few years, it's become even more important. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really interested in your, your book that you've just launched, Nine Ways to Develop Highly Effective Salespeople. So tell me something about how you came up with the nine ways and why they deserve to be um, in your list uh, in order to develop highly uh, effective salespeople. Sure, sure. So when I was studying in my PhD program, I did a project on uh, my dissertation, really, on self-directed learning. And what I wanted to understand really was, why is it that some people are really amazing when it comes to sales, 
Um, and then some people, you know, they get to a point where they've had some success, but then they start letting the the foot off the gas, right? They, they start, um, you know, going out and just playing golf all day on Friday and taking a half day. Um, and so what we were seeing was once people got to that $100,000 mark, that six figure mark, now this was back in the early 2000s. Um, once they got there, maybe in 2005, they would stop working as hard. But then there were some groups that would just keep working. It didn't matter how much success they had, how much money they were making. They were very, very successful and they continued to learn. So what we found was that people that were self-directed were actually the ones that were really those top performers. And the people that were not self-directed, once they felt like they were comfortable with their lifestyle, then they wanted to just relax. Um, so that really motivated me to start working with and working on this book because I understood that if you can use a self-directed learning approach, you can get so much more out of your sales team. So it's really a lot about um, you know, trying to figure out who the right people are and to train them. And we use some data um, that we found in the Rainmakers uh, program because we have these very robust profiles. So we brought some of that into it to help companies understand what is the mindset right now of that person that wants to be hired? Are they willing to relocate? What's most important to them? Is it compensation or is it professional development? Is it opportunity for growth? And what we found was that people want to grow in a company. They don't want to float around to company after company. They really want to grow and develop. And so managers need to learn how to support and grow and develop people on their team and really take an interest in them. And it might seem like common sense, but it's definitely not common practice. And then we talk about in there also the process following an actual sales process or a buying process. There's so many companies out there and they don't even have a defined process of how they sell or, you know, how they talk to their customers or, you know, even using tools like Medic uh, to, to help to move the sale forward. Um, we also talk about practice in the book and how practice creates confidence and you can create an environment where you're promoting and, and supporting practice. Um, also do a lot of improv training and adaptability training. So one thing that we know for sure is that everything is changing around us. And so talking about how you can teach your team how to think on their feet and how to adapt um, to anything that happens. If you can train those skills, then they'll be ready for anything. And, and you know, technologies change. Everything's changing around us, the customers, the products, um, the environment, politics, everything. So training some of these basic skills can help them to be able to adapt. Um, but none of that works if the employees don't feel safe. So they're not going to give feedback. They're not going to put themselves out on a limb. They're not going to stretch themselves if they don't feel like they're in a safe, collaborative environment. So how to create an environment like that, um, how to teach them how to use self-directed learning, how to find mentors and what that looks like. Um, also being a good leader uh, as a sales manager, how to be a better leader, how to serve your team so that your team wants to stay with you. Um, and then we also talk about how to make sure that your plan is working, how to create sales training and, and a plan around that. And so we've used the data. We've used a lot of research that's out there in order to create the different items in the book. Excellent. That sounds absolutely fascinating. There's one thing that um, <clears throat> I, I, uh, would like to pick up on is through self-directed learning and what you said that actually salespeople do not want to move around. They want to stay and they want to develop. But it's interesting that the data says it's around about the two year mark, whether you're a sales leader or whether you're a, a sales rep, you you move on. And actually the industry is used to um, recruiting people that, that move often. <laughs> So the, the two things seem to contradict, really, if the, the great salespeople want to stay longer and have a longer tenure, but actually the industry itself is used to this short tenure moving on and mm. having to rank people up again. How, how is that reconciled? So that all comes with that leadership and having the conversations, investing in your people. So you're hiring the right people and then you get to know them and help them understand, you know, 
what does that career journey look like for them? What do they want? Do they want to stay in a place? And I think if, if someone feels like I can be successful, I have a path that's going to help me to get to where I want to go. You have to have growth opportunities for your team. Um, and the students that were filling out the survey over 2000, what was most important for them was growth opportunities and professional development. So they want to go to a place where they can stay and continue to get development. But what's happening a lot of companies is they hire students or they hire new employees. They go through a training the first year and then there's no more training. They don't do anything else. They don't have these company-wide trainings. They don't have programs in place. So people are feeling like they're stagnant, like they're just they're, their skills are not getting refreshed. And I see that all the time from my students that have graduated. They'll ask to come back into my sales class and listen in because they're not getting any more training. So the sales manager's key in being able to take the time and talk to their people, find out what they want and help them so that they can understand their path and to be successful and to continue to learn and develop. So we're seeing that the managers that are taking time to do that, that are creating that career trajectory or journey, they're able to get their teams to stick around. Yeah, that's interesting. We were we were previously talking about customer experience and buyer experience and how important, you know, experience trump, trumps price and product. Mm-hmm. But that's dependent on employee experience and employee experience is dependent on consistency. So that means you need them to be there for more than the ramp up period for, for the year. So everything's uh, linked uh, together. If you can keep people, keep them motivated, then you're more likely to keep your customers as, as, as well. Customers hate it when someone they really like and they've engaged with and they've built up trust leaves. And often the customer leaves with the person. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. You have that, you have that trust and, you know, you want to stick with what you know. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. So um, in your view, let's uh, talk a bit about diversity. You're training many people to um, in sales and launching them into this sales industry. Uh, and it's uh, talking about a very attractive career prospects but actually they may then enter an organization that perhaps doesn't look like them doesn't quite feel you know it isn't what they were expecting so what do you think the industry needs to do to to continue to attract young motivated career orientated people what do you think is going wrong and what needs needs to happen in the sales industry Sure. I mean, you know, you see all these flyers where a company looks like, oh my gosh, there's so much diversity. There's people that are here that look like me. You know, I see this all the time with my female students too. And they're just like, oh, there's so many women in the posters. I see this, like everybody looks like there's so much like, you know, collaboration and everything. And then they show up and it's dominated and it's all white older males. And then they're just like, nobody looks like me. Nobody has the same interests as me. There's no groups in place where I feel like I'm a part of something. Everybody wants to go out and watch the game, but I'm not interested in that, you know, and having these conversations that are really not who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, So the companies are struggling. Maybe they have somebody that's coming out as a recruiter that's a woman or that looks like the person that they're trying to hire, but then nobody else in the organization is like that. They don't see a person that looks like them in a leadership role. And so, yes, I see a lot of companies are all over hiring for diversity. So you're diversifying at the lowest level of the organization. What about as we're going up into management or executive level positions? So we need to start doing the work to make sure that we're putting people in the right places, but not just putting them there. We need to make sure that they're getting the training and the support that they need, that they can find mentors that have had similar experiences as them and others that have had different experiences, but putting mentorship programs into place, having ERGs and having these work groups, um, providing specialized training uh, for people who maybe haven't been in a leadership position, who haven't had access to resources or opportunities before giving them the access that they need so that they can be successful. Um, That would be a great first step and putting more people into places all over the organization um, and giving diverse people a voice 
in the organization and a role in decision making. Those are all very important big steps. Um, a lot of companies are saying like, oh, you know, we're hiring for diversity, but there's no metrics that are associated with this. So they might hire, they might um, interview many diverse candidates, but then they're continuing to hire the same people. So there needs to be accountability around building up and improving organizations to have diversity in their voices and across the board. I think that's a great point that you're making. It's all very well saying that you're hiring for diversity, but without the metrics, and often what you'll find is within two years they've, they've left. Well, why are they leaving? Why are they not staying? What are we not doing really? Because it's very expensive to recruit anybody, but actually the more what you will often, I've seen quite a lot of stats. If you have a woman sales leader and there's only 17% and that, that figure hasn't changed in female um, sales leaders, that hasn't changed in a long time. If you have a woman in sales, they attract more diverse, not just women, but a diverse team. And so the higher up that woman goes, they attract and recruit more diversity into to the business. And so that's, I think that's one thing that you can do if you have at the top level, senior level, that diversity, then, you know, they're seen and it says a lot about the organization. So just attracting more people in. Um, I'd like Absolutely. to, sorry, go on, talk, say that again. Absolutely. It makes, it makes such a big difference, especially female students that I have I hear them all the time. And they're just like, you know, it's all male dominated and there's nobody that I can talk to. There's nobody that can help share a story with me because everyone's so different than, than I don't, I don't see myself growing here. I don't see myself continuing on. And then they also feel like they have to be the voice for everybody that looks like them. And that's a lot of pressure too. Um, and they may not want to have that role. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I certainly uh, find find that as well. I think it's important to just have the conversation and yeah, it's a job that you don't want, but you're going to have to do <laughs> if we want things to change. Exactly. That's the deal. Um, I, I um, wanted to ask you uh, about your tried and tested strategy that you would offer listeners to enable them to scale their sales. Sure. You know, I think... I, I learned this from Sam Nelson, actually at Outreach, and um, I always knew that you needed to follow up in a conversation. You know, um, you can't just have one conversation or one message and expect someone to buy from you. I always need, knew that you needed to follow up, but I never really understood how much you needed to follow up and how often you needed to follow up. And so I learned from um, some research reports, right? It's like follow up at least 15 times. And I thought, gosh, that's a lot. If somebody doesn't want to talk to you, just keep sending them messages so many times. But the reality is people are really, really busy and they might actually have a need for what you're doing. Obviously do your research ahead of time and make sure you're talking to the right people. But sometimes you just need to catch somebody at the right time. They might read your LinkedIn message and they're like, oh yeah, this sounds good. I'm going to get to that. It's just like that sweater you wanted to buy at the store and you're like, oh, I want to get that. And then it's like, when you finally get around to it, it's no longer being sold there. So you have to just continue to follow up and follow up and call and email and go on LinkedIn and, and message them and build a relationship, but have many different touch points of following up because at some point you're going to catch them and it's going to be the right time. Um, you can make so much more money if you just follow up, but we're all guilty of going in, writing a couple messages. Yeah, let's schedule something. And then life gets in the way. We never talk to that person again. And we could have really made a difference for them and helped them, but they're not going to come to us like, Hey, what did, what's that thing you wanted to sell me? They're not going to follow up. Right. So it's really important to um, continue to follow up much more than you need. And I think um, Sam Nelson wrote this uh, agoji sequence of how to follow up with um, LinkedIn messages with calls and with emails. And I think I want to say over the course of 30 days, um, there might be 20 to 25, I think, different protocols for following up with that same customer before you say, okay, clearly this isn't a good fit. I'll let you go for now and then maybe follow up with them, you know, past that. But within a month, he was suggesting, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 20 follow-ups to get them in and it's making them a lot of money. Wow. I think 
you wouldn't normally do that you know in your mind you think 20 in a month that's kind of harassment you know but actually because it's different touch points um then it doesn't feel qu quite so much i think the human nature would be that you would back off you'd feel that that's too much this is you know this is um spamming now uh and you need that data to continue to have the courage to go through what the human human nature would actually stop you from doing the data is actually yeah. telling you that this actually this does work but do it through different channels don't constantly send the same email over and over again that is and, and the big point is it's not always asking for what you want it's being of service it's i saw this article and i thought of you yeah. this could help you it's offering some kind of value to the customer because eventually they're going to see the value that you're able to bring it's not like 30 messages of like, can we meet yet? Can we meet yet? Did you want to come to this event? Can we, right? You like, that's just, oh, that's awful. Don't do that. But offering something that you can be of service and showing the value and showing that you truly want to help them. Um, something is very easy just to go in and build rapport by going into someone's LinkedIn and commenting or, you know, liking some of their content. That's a very quick thing that you can do to help to build up some of that report. And that is a touch point too. Just leaving a quick comment doesn't cost anything. It could take 10 seconds to be able to do that. And just to go in and you're showing them that you support what they're putting out there into the world very fast and easy to do. Yeah. I, and I think that's, that's a great point. It's, you know, we all get the angry emails. I've sent this before and you haven't responded. You know, kind of doesn't get a response, but the giving value, um, uh, and touching base with people if you understand the variety of things you can do then you don't feel that you're you you know you need to go in with those angry emails i absolutely get it that's fantastic so if you're on a desert island on your own stephanie what one thing would you take with you on my own would always have to be that utility tool right you see it at uh, the Home Depot or the Target or the, you know, Walmart or whatever store, right? And, and it's got, you know, the knife in it and the corkscrew and all the different things that you need. Like that is definitely what I'd want to have on hand if I was somewhere uh, on an island by myself, for sure. And I would always try to bring my husband because he can fix everything and build everything too. But uh, if I couldn't have him to do it, then I would have that all in one tool. He is the extension of the utility tool. He's the one that gets the utility tool to work because he can <laughs> fix anything right exactly <laughs> yeah exactly that's right that's 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 fantastic we always need someone that's handy uh, around us so uh I, yeah i might be borrowing your husband <laughs> <laughs> do you offer him out <laughs> well you know he's a contractor so he, he does oh. go up he helps people <laughs> there you go there you go stephanie how can listeners get hold of you uh, LinkedIn is a great way to get a hold of me and just, you know, keep in mind, my name is Stephanie with an F. That's a great way. Um, or they can email me at sboyer at bryant.edu as well. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad I have had you on to a podcast because I knew that um, you're doing so many exciting things and really to invest in creating the sales leaders of the future by starting at a level that's really important and you're you know influencing so many young women into sales so i thank you for being on scale your sales podcast uh, stephanie boyer phd oh, thank you so much and thank you for all you're doing you're making such a big difference janice and uh, i am a huge follower of your work i love what you're doing and i appreciate you and thanks for having me on thank you thank you for listening to this week's episode of scale your sales podcast if you like this discussion feel free to listen to other episodes or watch the caption show on youtube and subscribe to future episodes i would really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review on itunes thank you